Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 7M, the first of three lectures where we're going to work through three different problems involving a complete generation. And our first problem has us predicting the offspring genotypes in a cross where we're considering two linked genes, so we have to consider the effects of crossing over. In the upcoming lectures, we'll work on thinking backwards from the genotypes of the offspring to the genotypes of the parents, and we'll do the first of a number of problems where we're going to consider events in a single family, and we'll use pedigree drawings to guide our thinking. So here's our problem. You're breeding fancy geraniums. You didn't know people bred geraniums, but they do. They're very nice. And you want to create a variety that's homozygous for two recessive alleles. One is allele little r of gene r, which controls rough of leaves. The other is allele little c of gene c, which controls a cinnamon-like fragrance. And these two loci are on the same chromosome. And you're told that 50% of meioses have a crossover between the r and c genes. Now, your plan is you're going to create this variety by crossing two parent plants that are both heterozygous at the R and C loci. And you're told that you made these parents by crossing um, an RR homozygote with a little c, little c homozygote. You have to calculate how frequent will the desired progeny, homozygous for little r and homozygous for little c, how frequent will that progeny be among all the other offspring? So what's the first step? Well, you could say probably the first step is what will the gametes be? But then you realize, wait, what's the genotype of the parent plants? You're crossing two plants that are identical, but what's their genotype? Well, they're heterozygous at R and heterozygous at C. So their genotype must be big R, little r, big C, little c. Okay. The next step is to draw their chromosomes because we want to get to predicting what the gametes will be. And before we can do that, we need to know what chromosomes we're dealing with. And this is where it gets, a there's a new wrinkle comes in because you're not told directly the parents' chromosomes. You have to infer them. You're told how the parents, the parents of this genotype, they were made by crossing a parent with this genotype. I'm going to make that one in blue. And a parent with this genotype in green. So what are the parents, this individual's chromosomes going to be? These are the grandparents, in effect, of the desired plants. So this parent is going to produce chromosomes that have a little r. Because this parent is homozygous for little r, all their chromosomes will have a little r allele. But you're not told what allele they have at the C locus. Similarly, for this parent, you're told that they have the little c allele, but you're not told what allele they have at the r locus. And here's where knowing a convention comes in. Um, always, unless the problem is set up in different ways, but generally, if you're not told the genotype of a locus and it's not um, the object of the problem, you would assume that the genotype is wild type, that, that we only specify the alleles that differ from the standard wild type allele. So here, you can assume that the little r, little r parent is big C, big C. And you can assume that the little c, little c parent is big R, big R. So this parent has the dominant normal allele at gene C. This parent has the normal allele at gene R. So there's the parent chromosomes. The next step is we want to draw, oh, we drew the chromosomes. The next step is to figure out 
what are the gametes going to be? So this is where you have to think about the consequences of crossing over. So again, we'll draw the, the parent's chromosomes. We've got the blue chromosome, which has little r, big C, and we've got the green chromosome, which has big R, little c. What are the gametes going to be? Well, we can use the information that we're given. 50% of meioses will have a crossover. So let's do the easy part first. Half of the meioses will have no crossover. And the genotypes, the gamete genotypes they're going to produce are little r big C and big r little c. And those are going to be half each because there's no crossovers. So there's only parental gametes, and there'll be equal numbers of both kinds of parental gametes. The other half of the meioses are going to have a crossover. And in those meioses, we're still going to get two, half of the time, half of the gametes will have the parental genotypes. So of these, a quarter are going to be little r, big C, and a quarter are going to be big R, little c. The other half will be the chromatids that participated in the crossover, and they'll be recombinant. So we'll have a quarter big R, big C, and a quarter little r, little c. Now we can put these numbers together to give us the final frequencies of the gametes. So half of the time, we've got these. So that means in total, a quarter of all the gametes will be parental of this genotype from the no crossover um, meioses, and a quarter will be this parental genotype. Each of these are present again in, only, in the half of the meioses that had crossovers, so they'll each be present at one eighth of all of the gametes. Now we can put them together. These gametes are unique to the crossover class, so that's, that's the final frequency of those gametes. Sorry, that's an 8. But here we can combine these gametes and these gametes together, so we're going to have 3 eighths of this parental type, and we're going to have 3 eighths of this parental type. Now, I've got the gametes written down on the next slide, so you can work this out for yourself and see if you come up with the same answer. Now, here's a mating square. And this you'll notice this doesn't look like the mating squares you've seen before. In the mating squares you've seen before, all the compartments were of the same size. But now I've drawn them of different sizes, two big compartments and two little compartments. And that's because the most, the best way to use a mating square is to make the sizes of the compartments proportional to the sizes of the proportions of the different gamete types. So this is one eighth. This is one eighth. These are squares for the two recombinant types. And this is three eighths and three eighths. These are squares for the two parental types, and the same up here. So we can take the areas of the different compartments within the square to tell us the frequencies of the offspring genotypes. Now I've set this up as a question. What will be the frequency of little r, little r, little c, little c plants. And I'll tell you now, there's a hard way to do this problem and an easy way to do this problem, and I hope you figure out the easy way.
So the answer is 0 0.016, which I'll tell you is 1 over 64, which is, of course, 1 8 times 1 8. Now, the hard way to do this problem was is to fill in all the genotypes calculate all the offspring genotypes and work out the proportions. The easy way to do this problem is to say, okay, we only care about the offspring that have little r from both parents and little c from both parents. Using our, punts, our mating square diagram, we can confidently say that the only square that we care about is the one where the little r, little c gametes meet the little, from one parent, meet the little r, little c gametes from the other parent. This is one-eighth, this is one-eighth, this is a square that's one-eighth by one-eighth, it's going to be one-sixty-fourth in size, and it's going to contain the little r, little r, little c, little c offspring. So you can get this number without filling in the rest of the Punnett square. And if you think of that, that will make your life a lot easier. If you don't think of that, you fill in everything, and that will build your skill at thinking about genotypes, so that's useful too. So that the way I drew this meeting square isn't the only way to draw it. You realize that I, we can make our compartments different sizes, but we can also arrange the compartments in different ways. So I put the 1 8 compartments on the top at the edge, but I could just as easily, as easily have drawn a meeting square like this or like this. They would all have served the purpose just as well. There's no special reason for doing it in any particular way. So what we've done is we've done quite a complex problem. We were dealing with two genes on the same chromosome. They had a crossing over. We had to change our mating square to diagram the cross. We had to take crossing over into account in thinking through to predict the frequencies of the different types of gametes. So this was all using things that we'd done before, except for changing the shape of the mating square, which was something new. And the important message that I want to leave you with is you might think, okay, I've been shown how to do this problem. I'll just memorize this pattern. And then when I see another problem just like this, I'll be able to solve it too. Well, as you'll learn, genetics problems don't really work that way. We, there's no simple rules of procedure. You're going to get different kinds of problems all the time. And each new problem is going to require you to think back to the fundamentals of how meiosis works, how mating works, to predict the outcome. And that's, I think, much more challenging than simply memorizing some simple rules of procedure. So coming up next is the second of our problem. In this problem, we're going to work backwards. We're going to take offspring genotypes, and we're going to infer what the parent genotype must have been. I hope to see you there.